Okay, so let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Unto the end, the Psalm of David, hear, O God, my prayer, when I make supplication to thee, deliver my soul from the fear of the enemy. Thou hast protected me from the assembly of the women, from the multitude of workers of iniquity. For they have wetted their tongue like a sword, and they have bent their bow a bitter thing, to shoot in secret the undefiled. They will shoot at him on a sudden, and will not fail over all his enemies. For he has said in his heart, I shall not be moved from generation to generation, and shall be without evil. His mouth is full of cursing and bitterness and deceit. Under his tongue are labor and sorrow. He sitteth in ambush with the rich in private places, that he may kill the innocent. His eyes are upon the poor man. He lieth in wait in secret like a lion in his den. He lieth in ambush that he may catch the poor, that he may catch the poor man, to catch the poor whilst he draw, draw him to him. In his net he will bring him down, he will crouch and fall, when he shall have the power over the poor. For he has said in his heart, God hath forgotten, he hath turned away his face, and shall not see it to the end. So, when I look at our economic system, it is very clear to me that there are some bad, bad people out here that are in charge of our economic system. And the corruption that I see in every level is incredible. What I'm going to lay out for you today is that what we, you know, I hear some people say, well, you know, this is proof capitalism has failed. And then I hear the libertarian saying, well, um, you know, this is what the bad government manage things. The truth is, government and the markets have both failed. And, you know, I've watched the, the, the government, the, the uh, regulators, flock with the, the big banks. And really, this is man's fall in human nature. And, you know, the Psalms, let's see, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, they all mention the treachery of the rich over the poor. You know, sometimes when I give a talk, people say, well, it's conspiracy theory. But the fact is, is that the, the Psalms are filled with talks of, of the, the conspiracy of the rich over the poor. And so what we have today is absolutely nothing new. The only thing that is new is we have better technology and get it sped over a, a larger geographic area. Now, um, oops. so the first problem that, that people need to understand, and it's very sad, people don't understand our money system. So all of, the, all of our currency, everything that we have, all the money that we have, is, starts in the form of debt as a loan. So if we all paid off all of our loans, there would be no money. We'd have no means of exchange and we'd be reduced to barter. So in order to have currency for exchange, we have to create loans and borrow from the banks and pay interest. And you know, going back, this violates justice because the banks create money out of nothing. You've heard the term fiat currency. And the private banking system requires that interest be paid to the banks for our fiat currency. Now, in contrast, uh, the money to pay the interest on the currency uh, by the people, it has to be paid for by the people's efforts and activity. So the banks create the money out of thin air. We have to earn, the, we have to earn money to pay the interest. So the banks are getting something for nothing. So uh, currency can be also, you know, as an alternative, uh, like Lincoln Greenback and so forth, um, or even the way that our Constitution laid it out, the money can create money. You don't have to pay interest on it. It just can be created and then it's as a means of exchange without us having to pay interest. If, if, uh, just a real quick example. If there were only $100 of money in existence, $100 of money, that was all the money in the, uh, in the system. And it, since it's a debt-based money, let's say the interest is 5%, where does the 5% come from? It comes from a new loan. So in order to pay the interest on the existing money supply, we have to borrow more money. Money compounds, and it compounds exponentially, and, and that's the problem. I'll, I'll get this done. Okay. Um, so basically, our money supply is based on usury. So it, it creates social injustice at its root. So I'm going to read here from Aristotle. 
the most hated sort of loan getting, and with the greatest reason is usury, which makes gain out of money itself and not from the natural object of it. For money was created to be used in exchange, but not to increase its interest. Well, that's not apparent. Um, and this term, interest, topos, which means the birth of money from money, is applied to the breeding of money because of the offspring uh, resembles the parent. Wherefore, of all modes of getting wealth, this is the most unnatural. And those who apply by sort of trades, pimps and all such people, and those who lend money, lend small sums at high rates, for all these take more than they ought and from the wrong sources. What is common to them is evidently a sort of love of gain. Yeah, let's see. Um, so what he's saying here is money is not productive of itself. Money by itself is sterile. So whereas a cow, for example, it produces milk, it can reproduce itself, it, it can be used for meat, it, 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 it fructifies. Money by itself doesn't create any fruit. Only when, when man applies labor to capital are goods and services created. Money is a sterile thing. Now, in the Middle Ages, um, there was a distinction of loans that were usurious and loans of production. In other words, I could lend you money to buy a field, and we could share in the production of the field because we weren't using anything up. So this was not considered usury. Not all loans were considered usury. Okay, this chart, what I'm showing you here, is this is the miracle of compound interest. This is simply a dollar uh, increasing at, at 5%. And what you see is that it goes parabolic. So our money supply, our money system, is it always ends this way. Because you know, if, it, if it's going to compound exponentially, it will always end up with this kind of a, uh, of a slope. In the natural systems, of course, that just doesn't work. Something breaks. Okay, uh, this is these are some really great charts. Okay, so what we have here, this is the size of the economy right here. Going back, this is the going back to uh, 19 fourth quarter of 1951. This is the growth of the economy. This is the growth of our debt. Okay, do you recognize the curve from the one I just showed you? This here, um, this, this gray, that is, that's debt to the size of the economy. So we can see that debt was generally about 150% of GDP of, of gross domestic product or national income. It's now at 370%. So you can see here, the real economy, the one that provides real goods and services, is not keeping up with the growth of the money supply. Okay, here's another chart. This is this is uh, money supply. Uh, this is the economy growing at uh, five percent, which is what the real economy has grown since 1952. So that that's just this is a mathematical chart that's based on the math that's going from 1952 to present. The real economy has grown this fast. Debt in the economy has been growing at 8.79 percent. So we can see here that the money supply is outstripping the, the, the real economy. Here, um, 